Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Good afternoon and welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast. I should also say good morning and good evening too because this is a podcast after all and I have no idea when any of you are listening. It could be 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. for all I know. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening and welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast. I am your host, Nico Perino. And what do we do here? Well, every other week you and I take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. For those returning listeners, I want to make a quick ask of you here at the top of the show. If you like what we do, please do me a huge favor. Open up your podcast app, give us a five-star rating, and if you're so inclined, please leave us a review and subscribe. The aforementioned small, quick, momentary acts of kindness, I assure you, do wonders in helping us attract new listeners to this show. I should add that social media shares also help, as do follows on Twitter and likes on Facebook. Now, if you don't like what we do here, you can send me your gripes at so to speak at the fire.org. Again, that email address is so to speak at the fire.org. Constructive criticism is always welcome, but I warn you, it may not be taken lying down. This podcasting thing, after all, ain't all that easy. So, what day is it today? It's the Monday morning after the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl, and I, I feel as though I should mention that because my colleagues in Philly are washing the Crisco out of their clothes from last night's celebration. Well, I'm here taking a moment to introduce you to my conversation partner today. His name is Mark Hamilton, and he's a legend here at FIRE. He's a legend here at FIRE because in 2001, He was the president of the University of Alaska system, and during that time, he wrote a free speech memo that, in my estimation, is still the gold standard for a university president's response to a campus free speech controversy. In his one-page memo, then-president Mark Hamilton made it clear that the University of Alaska would be a no-censorship, no-nonsense zone. It would abide its responsibility to the United States Constitution, and free speech would not be qualified. He put that in all caps, actually, in his memo. His memo at the time made national news for its clear, concise, unambiguous directive, which, if you've been following these free speech controversies lately, you know can be a far cry from what we see from many university presidents these days. They can sometimes be a bit mealy-mouthed in their statements confronting free speech controversies of their own. But Mark Hamilton's memo was no such thing. And perhaps that's because he took a tact from his military days. You know, he spent 31 years before becoming president of the University of Alaska system. He spent 31 years in the United States Army, where he, get this, negotiated peace deals in El Salvador and Somalia, oversaw U.S. Army recruiting during the Be All You Can Be era, remember that, and he eventually rose to the rank of major general. Before that, he even got his English literature degree from Florida State University and taught English at West Point. So he's kind of a renaissance man. But that was all before he took his job at the University of Alaska, of course, a job that I should say he retired from in 2010 after 12 superlative years at the helm. So during this conversation, President Emeritus Mark Hamilton and I discuss his 2001 memo, of course, which I should add you can read in all of its glory by visiting thefire.org and searching Mark Hamilton or University of Alaska. And we'll actually read a little bit of the memo here in a moment, but other things we'll discuss on this show. Uh, We'll discuss differences between his approach to free speech controversies and the approaches of other college presidents. Uh, We talk about what it's like to run a large organization. Most of us haven't. Uh, He ran two of them, the University of Alaska, of course, and the 12,000 person, $1 billion U.S. Army recruiting project, again, during the Be All You Can Be era. And we'll close this conversation by talking about about something that Mark knows a hell of a lot about, talking across lines of difference and the art of the negotiation, which, as I said, he learned a thing or two about from his army days negotiating with warlords in Somalia and rebels in El Salvador. Mr. Hamilton and I spoke on Wednesday, January 17th, and we spoke over the phone since I don't have the budget to travel to Alaska to conduct these interviews. So the interview sounds like it's a phone interview. That is, well, because it is. Now, with that, I'll turn it over to me from three weeks ago and the conversation I had at that time with the peerless Mark Hamilton. 
All right, Mark, uh, thanks for talking to me today. Looking forward to it, Nico. So you're a bit of a legend here at FIRE. Uh, you <laughs> Back in 2001, you wrote this famous one-page memo uh, defending the freedom of speech and also academic freedom in the University of Alaska system. Did you know at the time that in writing that memo you were doing something few college presidents do when confronting speech controversies on campus? I did not, Nico, at all. I just had a circumstance where people uh, needed to get their heads around it. Sometimes that happens, I think, uh, with freedom of speech issues, that simple confrontation can make people go, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. And um, it's just it's just an area that I've been uh, very very defensive of uh, from from the beginning. You know, as a as a soldier, you end up spending a lot of your time in countries that don't understand <laughs> the significance of these uh, bill of rights. How did you hear about the controversy surrounding Professor Linda McCarriston? She was on the creative writing faculty at the University of Alaska, sort of a famous poet, and she wrote this poem uh, for, I believe it was called Ice Flow was the name of the journal. It's a journal of poetry, creative writing from North America, and her poem addressed sexual abuse in uh, Native communities, and the Native communities were offended by her portrayal and or discussion of sexual abuse within these communities, and as a result, it seems like one or more students complained to the dean of uh, the school or another university administrator uh, and organized a campaign to get Professor McCarriston fired. And then eventually the story got on your desk. How did you find out about it? Um, there, there was a controversy and uh, then what came on my, my desk was a clearer picture that what had happened is the uh, chancellor uh, had responded to the heat by saying, I'll investigate this. And it just so it, it, it had hit at a time where there were a couple of these things, you know, and sometimes that happens. Sometimes coincidence will help you uh, focus and all of a sudden, wait, wait a minute, this is not just an aberration. Here's two or three of these things. Um, we're, we're misunderstanding. Uh, freedom of speech and academic freedom. Yeah, there was also a controversy surrounding oil drilling in Alaska. A group of professors uh, were speaking out against it, and were there, there you go. That is a case where, and and you know, this is a walk like you talk. I was called by the governor and said, "What are you going to do about this?" We had twelve professors, I think, signed a, a thing, it's a full page ad that says, "Don't drill in Anwar." What are you going to do about this? I said, I'm going to do nothing. They have the right to do this. And I said, and I recommend to you, sir, that you do nothing either. I mean, seriously, that had happened. And so I had kind of, I mean, I had walked the walk. I was very confident myself. I mean, you know, you don't want to make a governor angry, but I'd rather have an angry governor than an misinformed governor who thinks that the president of the university is going to shut down uh, freedom of speech. I do kind of want to read our listeners a large portion of your memo. Uh, it's written in this very militaristic style insofar as there's no throat clearing. It's one page, five paragraphs, uh, very short, powerful, punchy sentences. You, could, you cannot come away from this memo with any lack of clarity as to what you are supposed to do. So the, re the memo begins in the third paragraph. Uh, this is the third sentence as well. Demands for action regarding constitutionally guaranteed freedoms of speech cannot be qualified, cannot be qualified as in all caps. Attempts to assuage anger or to demonstrate concern by qualifying our support for free speech serve to cloud what must be a clear message. Noting that, for example, the university supports the right to free speech, but we intend to check into this matter, or the university supports the right of free speech, but I have asked Dean X or Provost Y to investigate the circumstances is unacceptable. There is nothing to check into, nothing to investigate. Opinions expressed by our employees, students, faculty, or administrators don't have to be politic 
or polite. However personally offended we might be, however unfair the association of the university to the opinion might be, I insist that we remain a certain trumpet on this most precious of constitutional rights. I am directing you, the chancellors, to effect wide dissemination of this letter. I would prefer it to go forward with your endorsement. Stirring language, eloquent in its clarity. Let's, let's, take this, let's, let's explore this line by line. The freedoms of speech cannot be qualified. Too often on college campuses right now, we are seeing uh, the freedoms of speech qualified. And I want to infer good motives on the pe- part of the people who do it. They, the freedom of speech can be sort of a messy thing. It can mean feelings get hurt. It means you have to do some deep introspection of your most deeply held beliefs because you are confronted with ideas that might challenge those those beliefs. So if you care or are empathetic towards some people who are hurt by the free exchange of ideas, uh, it might seem logical to bend your support or qualify your support in a certain way that doesn't seem directly da- damaging, though it might be chilling, have a chilling effect. Um, or we might say it ha- might have a chilling effect if you're a First Amendment. Advocate. So on campuses, we see this all all the time. The university supports the right to freedom of speech, but, and then they explain, but we only, you know, speech must be civil, but speech must support our values. Uh, there are some people out there who sort of um, <laughs> call call the people who do this buttheads, and then and then also this, and you you go on to say that you you know you can't. For example, say the university supports the freedom of speech, but I have asked Dean X or Provost Y to investigate the cir- circumstances. Many courts have actually held that investigations into clearly protected speech is in itself a First Amendment violation. But universities or min- administrators will do this either to placate a, a, um, a group of people who want an investigation is speech, a firing of a professor, or they themselves think that an investigation is warranted. But if the speech on its face is constitutionally protected, there's nothing to investigate. When FIRE writes our, letter, our letters to universities, we often hearken back to your letter and say, when there is protected speech, and that is all that is at issue, there is nothing to investigate. I'm wondering what your philosophical thinking here was in, in writing these lines, because it's not intuitive to everyone, especially someone who's in the position of power, who is a university president, who has many stakeholders to please. Um, I don't know. It might, uh, it might have a, a whole lot to do with, uh, I'm kind of a rule follower, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm offended by it, though. So, I mean, I, it, was, it was easy to, uh, to, to act uh, with with clarity and with certainty, um, because um, I believe it. It's just kind of that simple. You know, it, what we end up doing is, um, oh, I read somewhere it was 20 years ago that something like 98% of Americans will say, I believe in freedom of speech. I mean, it's, it's, it's bigger than motherhood and apple pie put together. I, I think we've got the data wrong. I think what happens is a hundred percent of Americans believe in freedom of speech ninety eight percent of the time, and it's those two percent oh that freedom of speech oh, and they want to uh, they want to run from it and they want to quell it well you're exactly right i mean there's there's been, were three studies that came out at the end of last year that found exactly that phenomenon. People will support freedom of speech generally, but as soon as you get into the nitty gritty and ask them about specific cases, specific people, specific events, that freedom of speech, the support for the freedom of speech of those individual people or those organizations can drop off precipitously along party lines or along um, ideological lines. Right. But... John Stewart, uh, the old TV host uh, on Comedy Central, once said, "You know, if your values crumble when you're when they are challenged, they're not values; they're hobbies. 
if freedom of speech, it, it, no, it is. It, it's great because if freedom of speech, you say if freedom of speech is your, one of your values, but the value crumbles as soon as you are approached with an opinion that offends you. It's an, it's no longer a value. What it is, it's to, it's a, a convenient hobby at times. Yeah, yeah. I, well, that's again the thing that I think is so important about it is it certainly has been my experience that if you are sufficiently steadfast to instruct the other, the, the complaint, overwhelmingly, the response is, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, you're right. You're right. Uh, I, I think it certainly doesn't, doesn't add to these things by, by being somehow afraid, which shows it ends up being people don't know what to do offering a courtesy that, that that isn't necessary like oh i understand your concerns and everything and i'll look into this all of this stuff is it, it expresses uh, a lack of certainty if you express certainty overwhelming number of people will just say oh gosh you're right of course you're right so it's, it, you, you need, that's that's the key is Come on, this one, we just don't budge on this. Well, some of it, I think, is about leadership. And I want to ask you, as uh, the former leader of large organizations, where it's quite hard to know what's happening at every level at a large institution like a university. So we, we will often come down hard on the presidents of the university because these are the figureheads. These are the people responsible for everything that happens beneath them. Uh, but I also understand that they might not be aware of the controversy until our letter hits their desk. How, as the leader of a large organization, do you ensure that the people beneath you are implementing your broad policy directives in a way that's consistent with your values, or maybe you even have to go a step back than that. Like, how do you indicate to your organization what your value values are? Because I think if you do that clearly, and and it's enforced, then people know how to do almost every step of their their job because they know the the long they they know the four or five values that should inform every every action. But I, I'll turn it over to you because you know more about this than me. Well, let me just say this. Uh, I, would, I would disagree slightly with the idea that it's the job of a leader to instill his or her values on the institution. It is most certainly the job of a leader to uh, seek to understand the values of the institution uh, uh, of which they, they uh, have a leadership position. Uh, those values tend to be uh, available, whether they're written down on a sheet or not, you can discover uh, what the values are of, of an institution pretty quickly. And you need to uh, support those values and, uh, I think, uh, award those values in the sense that if you, if you um, believe, as, for instance, the University of Alaska did, uh, that uh, students were really the, the, the center point of uh, Kind of a, this is why we're here. And uh, it was a value shared by virtually everybody. Uh, so what you do as a leader there is you say, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, nominated by peers, we're going to recognize um, with a cash award and they ended up being you know, two-round uh, trip tickets to, uh, to uh, wherever you want to go, to those uh, five or six people selected by their peers, who had most represented the value, what we called make students count. What have you done? Who are the people out there? Nominated by the peers. And that's what you do about values. You support them, and to the, depending on, on what kind of latitude you have, you reward people who are who are showing those values every day. Um, that was, I think that's the way to do it. This other thing you mentioned, though, let me just touch on this just a little bit, you know, because it's something that uh, 
I, I've almost had a little fun with, I guess, uh, throughout my life. And this, uh, it, it, every piece of, of my life, I've done this. You need to understand, as you said, you need to understand that it's highly unlikely that you will be able to understand the ramifications of your standard operating procedure or the uh, how your memorandum will will uh, affect a particular piece of your organization. There's just too many little bounces and and, and U turns and everything else down in that in that great organization. So what uh, what I have done, and as I said, I had a little fun with this because but here's here's what I've told people: the chances that the people in high places in an organization are truly stupid is so unlikely that you're best uh, served by believing that there are not. I used to tell the folks if we threw away all the stupid people uh, in charge of the University of Alaska, it wouldn't even solve the parking problem. Uh, having said that, you will certainly, and this is something I talk, you know, talking to big groups of faculty, of students, teachers, everybody, say, but you will certainly see a memorandum, um, uh, some sort of a, of a regulation, a decision that is stupid. And what I'm afraid of is that a time or two, my name is going to be at the bottom of those. So what I'm asking you to do is apply the stupid rule. This is stupid. He isn't stupid. Therefore, I know something he doesn't know. He knows something I don't know, or the message is garbled. If you can instill that kind of openness to correction, to clarification, uh, to instruction from the huge number of people that end up working for you in a large organization, if you can get that feedback, you can appear to be a genius because you're, you're capturing all of the, uh, of the input and and all of the things you cannot see, if they can come to you and say, hey, I got, I got this memo. It's, it's just stupid. Well, to be honest with you, 90% of them are, wasn't communicated in enough clarity. This, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a communication problem. Well, there's there's a parallel there to academic freedom and the freedom of speech. The idea being that the pursuit of truth is more or less a process of disconfirmation. And if people are afraid to speak up when they see a thesis put forward or that is wrong or a, a set of evidence that is being misconstrued, then that thesis never gets corrected or tweaked or disconfirmed or the evidence uh, or the, the process that went into finding the evidence never gets fixed. Uh, this is why we have in academic journals peer review. But if there, is, if there is a system that prevents that, a culture that does not allow for open disagreement or that sets a certain puts together a list of things that cannot that can be broached or can't be broached you you lose that crucial component to correct error right oh i think you have hit it just dead on it, this is something that i have described as the fragility of certainty okay if if you have a and I love I love thesis because I love to play with that. I I I really I've given little uh, little speeches on the death of the dialectic here uh, of late. I, I I really think that the thesis uh, and the antithesis uh, reasoning together leading to a synthesis is exactly the way things are are done. Uh, what 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 is missing from I think from leaders. Uh, across the board is something that I don't think people would associate. It's doubt. Okay, you need to understand that you are not putting forth theses. 
These are hypotheses, uh, which I like to uh, clarify. Hypothesis. It's beneath a thesis. It's beneath certainty because it has not been buoyed with all of the possible uh, inputs to it. Uh, that's the world we live in. Now, what happens with this is where the fragility of certainty. If you have no doubt, if you have no doubt, then an assault on your thesis um, is going to crumble you. Uh, if, if you are willing to engage in the dialectic, okay, I've learned something here, you're far more likely to see a modification of your former stance, not a complete destruction of it. So think in terms of, uh, I think this is the, I think this is the case today. You know, let's just do one of these general what is going on out there uh, kind of views. Uh, we're missing doubt. We have people who are absolutely certain, based on nothing, based on uh, you know, uh, boy, that that's a good bumper sticker. I think I'll I think I'll passionately believe in that. <laughs> well, John, this is something that even the great philosophers talked about, going all the way back to Marcus Aurelius, one of the great leaders, uh, in his in his meditations. But John Stuart Mill talks about this as well in his book on liberty. He says to refuse a hearing to an opinion because they are sure that it is false is to assume that their certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. Oh wow, that's beautiful. And I and I'm not familiar with that. that I, that's 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 a beauty. It comes from the early chapters of uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, which I would highly recommend to you. But this bit this bears out in reality too. We can see practical results from keeping lines of communication open so that we can correct error. I, I read um, one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. I forget which one. It might have been Outlier, but I'm. I'm not certain. And it talked about, it explored the reasons that in East Asian airline companies, you had more plane crashes than you did in Western airline companies. And they couldn't figure that what, out what was happening for so long because they, had, they did the same sort of maintenance checks. Uh, the, the equipment was the same. There's Airbuses, there are Boeings. And what they ended up finding out was that in a lot of these East Asian cultures, you have a great respect for hierarchy and authority. So when the pilot makes a mistake, the co-pilot seeing the pilot's seniority would be hesitant to correct them. Yeah. So they fixed it by training this out of, uh, of the airline industry. And, and, and Every, everybody has the right to say, stop. Yeah. No, that is very, very important. Uh, and you know, in some sense, that's what stupid rule tries to do. Uh, it, it says, you know, if you get something that doesn't make any sense, it's stupid. Tell me, you know. And so often, it, you know, I mean, I don't want somebody crumbling this thing and say that's stupid, president. I want somebody saying, okay, wait a minute, I know something he doesn't want, and he wants to know that. You know, I, I, I tell people, listen for the conversations. If somebody's holding a, a, a memo or something like that, doesn't he know what this will do to our organization? Well, if it's bad, no, he doesn't know. <laughs> of course not. He's not, he's not going to put forth something like that. I want to pivot now to talk about your time in the, in the U.S. Army, and in particular, um, your peace uh, negotiations in El Salvador in 1991, where I believe it was 1991, correct? That's correct. I was there a little over two years. Where where you uh, convinced rebels to give up their arms, and I think you did it in Spanish, right? Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> did you learn Spanish for that express purpose, or did you know it already? No, no. I uh, I ended up uh, took uh, quite a bit of uh, Spanish in high school, and then again at uh, at West Point. Um, and uh, I think I think I uh, I think I doomed myself to this uh, kind of assignment because about couldn't have been more than two years before that, so I'd already been there in about 20 years. And uh, I sat down, was chatting with my wife one time, and I said, you know, there's only two things I regret in my life. One 
is I never learned how to play the piano, and two, I've never had a chance to uh, use my Spanish. And kebab! There was. <laughs> About two years later, I get assigned uh, to, uh, to El Salvador with the remarkable order. Mark, I want you to make peace. In this 12-year civil war, killed 70,000 people out of a population of 7 million, although a million of them uh, went to the United States. Um, I, I, I've described this to people as like a bad B movie. Um, first of all, I had no more idea than a chicken that I was supposed to do. And uh, frankly, it's not well informed by the State Department. Um, making peace is not exactly what they do. They they end up with a, a kind of carrot and stick approach, which I have not uh, uniquely described as uh, beating people with the carrot and making meat the stick. They uh, they really don't have much of a plan for making peace. Um, and so it was difficult uh, to figure out what are you supposed to do. And my solution was, let me go out and talk to the guerrillas. Let me go talk to the revolutionaries. Uh, it was easy to talk to the uh, armed forces of El Salvador. Let me go out there and talk to the other other folks, and uh, they uh, allowed me to do that. And um, you know, over time, mm -hmm. people reasoned through it, and um, got to the United Nations. At which time, it uh, broke down. <laughs> and uh, in in what was a, just an enormous uh, moment in my life. Uh, both sides uh, called back to the embassy and said, uh, could you send Colonel Hamilton to the United Nations um, to try to fix this? Both both sides. Wow. Um, well, at that stage of the game, obviously, you got to leg up. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we spent about eight and a half days. Um, of course, Thomas Pickering uh, was our ambassador, and he was the lead. I mean, I was just... Uh, just there. But, uh, you know, kind of my claim to fame is, I mean, here's Thomas Pickering, this magnificent statesman and uh, and servant of the United States, and literally shuttled me back and forth in his car between uh, the, uh, the negotiating team for the uh, FMLM and uh, and the negotiating team for the government. Well, it almost teaches you a lesson about about negotiation and that maybe one of the most important components of a negotiation is that the person mediating needs to be trusted by both sides. I mean, it sounds like they chose you because they trusted you. You know, I think that's true. We actually had a, um, a little um, retrospective here uh, that was uh, Columbia uh, University uh, and uh, NYU did one this, uh, this last summer, 25 years afterwards, with the idea of kind of looking at, um, this was this ended up in a piece that's never been broken. I mean, there's been no violations of the ceasefire. The, uh, the uh, FMLN uh, became the political party, elected two consecutive mayors of uh, San Salvador, and then uh, ultimately elected the president of uh, San Salvador. So, I mean, this complete transition. So the idea really was let's gather all the people who had some piece of that and see if there are any lessons learned out of that that could be applied to other circumstances. Frankly, uh, the conclusion of that was kind of, you know, probably not. There were just so many things that just happened almost randomly that, you know, probably you couldn't do that. But at that time, I had an opportunity to meet uh, one of the people on the uh, negotiating team, had been on the lead, who had written the book on the whole peace process. And, and I got to ask him, a fellow by the name of uh, Santo Mayor. And I said, Why did you call me? 
And he said, we knew exactly who you were, exactly what you've done, and we trusted you. So you nailed it. That's exactly what happens. It's, uh, it's trust. You, to be an important negotiator, you need to have no power. They, both sides want to give you power. They want to say, fix this. And the answer is, I can't fix it. I have no power. However, here are a couple of things that you might do that would cause the reaction you're looking for. And then you kind of, you know, kind of go through that. And it's just a lot of <sighs> moving forward and then have it crash because somebody does something outrageous. I mean, the number of times that individual pieces will uh, snatch uh, defeat from the jaws of victory or just make you scream. And you just need to have the patience to start again uh, at the beginning and let's build this one more time. So the El Salvador and there, the El Salvador is kind of in the news right now because there was a recent decision by the federal government uh, to um, end the asylum for Salvadorians. I, I don't think as a result of this this civil war, but as a result of a natural disaster back in the early two thousands, uh, something like hundred thousand of them need to need to go back to El Salvador by 2019. But uh, that's a that's a separate story completely. Your successes in El Salvador resulted in a another assignment in Somalia, uh, which is quite different. You say you say you can't uh, you can't apply all these tactics successfully in every circumstance, but the Somalian uh, peace negotiations, if I'm not mistaken, were successful at the end of your assignment, but then deteriorated. And you were there in 1993. Was that the year of Black Hawk Down? Uh, yeah, but it had not, uh, they, it, that had not happened by the time that my uh, stay was, uh, was ended there. Well, you know, that, uh, see, there's, the problem is, I, I told you I didn't know what I was doing. So when I went to, when I went to Somalia, I mean, I was a one trick pony. I said, okay, let me find the bad guys. Where are they? And they were out in the, you know, Hershey Morgan was out in the bush and, uh, and I got a hold of them by ham radio and said, I'd like, come and talk to you. And, and we did. Um, give, you, give you an interesting little, little side story there. Talking about flying from Keith Mayo for an hour and a half in a Black Hawk helicopter to find Hershey Morgan's forces. They're up near the Kenyan border. And I get up in the helicopter and I go over to meet it. And the first thing that Hershey Morgan says to me, uh, perfect English, is, did you hear what BBC said about me last night? <laughs> it was a guy who was very concerned with his public image. Uh, so, you know, you put that in the back of your mind. Say, so, okay, uh, how, can I, how can I use that? Well, later on, when uh, we started talking about... Uh, Let's let's turn in weapons. I mean, if you get rid of the these um, false symbols of power, um, it can lead to to dialogue and ultimately lead to, to peace. So I said, you know, why don't you uh, why don't you turn in some weapons? Okay, let's just and they don't they don't have to be your best weapons. Take. You got machine guns out there. I can see from here it don't work. Uh, let's do, and you know what? If you do that, I'll have BBC come in and film it. So you'll get all the credit. Mm, yeah. Now, by, now, by the way, if you choose not to do this, I'm going to offer the same thing to Omar Jazz, but you have first choice. I mean, of course, he did it. But he had planted the seed. You got to be powerless. He had planted the seed. This is this. It told me something about him, and so I, um, I just exploited that knowledge of uh, 
of his wanting to have a good public image. So the this all comes to you know a discussion of what are good negotiation tac- tactics, but it, it, it speaks to this larger issue which Fire is concerned about. Um, and is one of the normative principles that undergird why we have a First Amendment in in the first place, which is talking across lines of difference is important. Um, exactly. And it's hard to do that when people are thinking in black and white, good versus evil, um, when there's either a complete agreement or no agreement, or and when you're assuming that someone's worst possible motive is their only possible motive. What are some What are some of the lessons that you learned in El Salvador in 1991 and in Somalia in 1993 about talking across lines of difference, about encouraging people to do more talking across lines of difference and not retreat into their tribal camps, both literally and metaphorically? And yeah, and that's precisely what happens. It's almost worse uh, today than I see here. Uh, you know, what you discover is something that we all kind of know intuitively. When you go to these folks and talk with them, what you discover is that 75, 80% of uh, your opinions uh, and your, your your values are their values. I mean, human beings across every sort of uh, race, uh, ethnicities, um, language, age, we're all human beings to a huge extent, and that's not romanticizing. That's just reality. Uh, I, I, these these folks that I dealt with were fundamentally identifiable as as human beings. They had uh, they had pride. They had fears. They had, uh, and you can deal with all that if you are um, uh, humble. Uh, if you are. Um, Clearly wanting to help, and if you have a, a really certain goal, you know my goal here is peace. That's what I'm going to do every single every single time. What we're dealing with though today in this nation, uh, which is terrifying, is they would not they whoever they have to be would not invite me to their camp. They would not allow me to be in there, and the reason is okay. What do we got? We got a white old male. So at that stage of the game, they think they know exactly who I am, exactly what my opinions are. I think of this as kind of bigotry primed, okay? This is the intolerance, you know, bigotry is the intolerance of those who hold different opinions. But we've gotten to the point where we generalize to the point that it assigns those opinions based on age, ethnicity, gender, even geography. If you're from here, if you did this, if you voted for, if you're a male, if you're, then you hold these opinions um, with no investigation uh, of your opinions, with no, no, never mind questioning the values of them. They didn't even question what are they? What are your opinions? But how much how much of that is a tale as old as time? I mean, we we are evolved from tribes, and we've always we have this sort of like evolutionary instinct to look askew at people who are different along a number of different axes. Is there something in society right now? And I know a lot of people speak to towards social media, twenty four hour news cycle that is that is amplifying or that is short circuiting sort of the side of our brain that uses reason to overcome these these evolutionary tribal instincts the 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 super ego to our id is getting short-circuited well i think it is you know um uh, tom nichols wrote a book called the death of expertise that i think is a is a fascinating thing and i I think it was uh, tom nichols who assigned this to you know we've got a generation of people who have spent 20 years looking at a split tv set where uh you have two experts uh, with entirely different opinions uh, yelling and shouting at one another, and what ends up happening is you kind of pick one. This is an issue here that uh, that college professors are dealing with. I mean, the the idea of uh, of expertise is challenged enormously for lots and lots of reasons. Uh, you know, my own absolute guess is that uh, over time, universities have... Uh, 
students have become customers. Uh, I've, I've got to I've got to have the tuition, and therefore I've got to make sure that I don't insult them um, by you know by what by by correction by by knowledge. Uh, the idea of sitting at the feet uh, of a professor and uh, and I understand that's romanticized dramatically, but the idea that they know more than you. I'll give you something I have I have remembered forever. In 1971, I'm in a Shakespeare class uh, at uh, Florida State University. Uh, a professor by the name of Harry Morris, and uh, it was great going to his classes because none of the masters, very few of the master's degree students, would take his classes because oh my God, Harry gave bees and an occasional C. And nobody wanted to go to this. So you'd go there and there would be like 12 people in this magnificent full professor teaching this, this course. And at one time he was confronted by uh, some young man who was terribly full of himself and had uh, presented some outlandish uh, interpretation of a particular uh, scene in play. And uh, and Harry kind of gave him some some correction and uh, and another opinion and this sort of and the you know guy left with this famous well my opinion is just as good as yours and Harry paused for a moment and he said yes though not so learned <laughs> <laughs> I just that just struck me so bad well today I think our professors are. Uh, are being confronted with my opinion is good enough. And, and I've been told since I was in the second grade that, oh, that's a good opinion. Because people don't want to insult children or, or uh, somehow uh, confine their, their knowledge by telling them, no, that's... Uh, well, there's a certain... There's a certain sense that an attack on an idea is an attack on the person. And to the, to the extent that that deteriorates in the academy, the pursuit of knowledge and dialectic deteriorates. The, uh, if you feel emotionally attacked every time someone challenges your thesis, uh, it's hard to ga- engage in dialogue. And you're, you're correct. But you also have a strain in philosophy that says that experience should be on par with logic and reason. You know, experience is an important component of understanding the world, but if I get mugged on the street corner and then develop a prejudice against people wearing leather jackets and all black because that's what my mugger was wearing, that ex- and that experience does not tell me how I should live my life in the world running across the street every time I see someone in a leather, leather jacket needs to be informed by much more than experience. Otherwise, we start holding prejudices and dogmas. No, absolutely right. It, it, although, it's, it's, you say, it's difficult. It, it is, it's a lot easier uh, to... When we, we, we reward this idea of being offended, uh, it's it's not the greatest status that anyone could have uh, to be offended, but victim status has become a very very powerful, uh, I think, avoidance mechanism. Uh, there are real victims. I understand that, but the claim for victimhood, uh, as it applies to instruction. And I am somehow diminished because you disagree with me, even though you're a professor with years of study in this particular arena. Um, that 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 can't help. Uh, you know, one of the things that that, uh, that happens is y- you need a coach. We all need coaches. And uh, my my favorite thing, I think, probably if I if if you said, okay, here's a class of people who who have this uh, concern about them, I, I might share with them. Uh, a couple of lines from uh, James Dickey's poem called The Bee. He says, old coaches live in the air, son. 
They live in the ear. When needed, they rise and curse you, scream when something must be saved. They urge, they urge. They want you better than you are. And as a professor, that's what they want. They want people better than they arrived in that classroom, that they have a wider spectrum of thought to compare, that they have learned to, uh, to listen to and evaluate other opinions, modify their own, present their own. Uh, they want them better than they were. This isn't a come on in here and I'll give you an A because this is a high-priced university and if I give you a B, your dad might not uh, need his pledge uh, next year. Uh, I want you to actually learn something. And I would guess that the overwhelming majority of college professors, one, believe that they have the capacity to expand the knowledge and, and the reasoning of their students. And number two, um, are uh, put that upon themselves as that's what I'd like to do. I would like to present them with uh, thoughts, uh, evaluate their response to those thoughts, um, and uh, make them better than they were. I want to ask you. Um, you know, as we wrap up here, one, one question about maybe explore one avenue as to why our ability to talk across lines of difference, synonym for that is negotiate, is deteriorating. And I've, I've been turning this idea around in my head, how much of our inability to talk across lines of difference or to negotiate towards, you know, shared outcomes or goals is a result of a culture that demands radical transparency and that views negotiations not as negotiations but sort of zero sum battles between good and evil and you know when i speak about radical transparency i mean you know if you're making concessions behind the scenes during the negotiation or using candid language that if it is revealed to your team or to the public before the negotiation is complete i could see a situation in which that could blow up the the process. Like how mu- how successful would your negotiations in Somalia and El Salvador have been if every word uttered during the negotiations was on the record? Because it seems as though today that's sort of what the public demands. There's no backward war- backroom deals is a pejorative now, and you don't see as many of them anymore as a result. But how much of of the backroom is it important in a negotiation? Well, I think it's I think it's absolutely important because a person who's got to be able to reveal uh, kind of who they are, and you get an opportunity to explore that what I called seventy five eighty percent of the uh, of the things that you have very much in common. You know, I had a chance uh, many years ago. I was on a, a, a remarkable board, and uh, I had been asked by. Uh, the Democratic Party in uh, Alaska to come and talk to them about uh, talking uh, across the lines. Uh, and so uh, th- I'm, this is going to get around to an answer. I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, I, I was leaving. Uh, and I accepted that, said sure. And uh, so then I went to this uh, this board that I was on. Well, this was quite quite a board. Um, and Tom Daschle, Leon Panetta, um, Christy Todd Whitman, uh, uh, Simpson from uh, Wyoming, very important people. And uh, so I had the chance to talk to them and said, what, what about this talking across the lines and all of that, 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 that stuff? I mean, how every single one, I've asked them individually, each of them sighed and said, it used to be that way. Only Tom Daschle said, wow, it used to be that way. Do you know why it's changed? I'm going, got my pencil out here. <laughs> Let's figure this one out. And uh, I, I don't know that I can list them all, but he just said them right off the top of his head. He said, uh, num- number one is uh, jet travel uh, has uh, 
allowed people to return to their uh, home district over a weekend where we didn't used to be able to do that. Number two was PACs, which uh, uh, the need for raising money uh, diverts people from from Washington and also from their even from their home state. Uh, but that's kind of covered because of gerrymandering and uh, and uh, you know pretty safe seats. And finally, uh, there is the uh, the famous soundbite, which he said it's simply a uh, a case of, uh, of of human beings that it's easier to express a point of disagreement in 15 seconds than it is to explain uh, the parts that you agree. All of this together says they do not have this back room uh, experience. The back room experience used to be that their kids played on the same soccer team, that that they had uh, neighborhood barbecues, where they knew the person across the aisle. Now the only time they confront them is on the record. That's what's happened. Yeah, on the on the House or Senate floor. Exactly. Yeah. And so they haven't had the opportunity to discover that 80% of what they believe in is exactly coincident. Well, uh, President Emeritus of the University of Alaska, Major General in the U.S. Army, uh, Mark Hamilton, thanks for coming on the show. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. That was University of Alaska President Emeritus and retired United States Army Major General Mark Hamilton. To learn more about Mark and his career, you can, of course, Google him. There's a lot about him on the internet and shouldn't be hard to find some of the articles written about him. But to the extent you want to learn more about the 2001 memo and the campus controversies that sparked it, visit thefire.org and search Mark Hamilton or the University of Alaska. As always, I'll also have an article up on FIRE's website about this episode with links to the primary source documents. But before I sign off here, I want to take a brief moment to point you in the direction of a new FIRE-supported free speech podcast. It's the same podcast I told you about two weeks ago. It's called Clear and Present Danger, A History of Free Speech, and it's hosted by FIRE visiting fellow Jakob Mushingama. Now, last week, Jakob released his Ancient Athens episode, and I must say, it's awesome. If you love history podcasts and free speech stories or philosophy, you're going to love this podcast. You can find it wherever podcasts are found, and he publishes his podcasts every other Thursday alternating with mine, so you're not going to be having two free speech podcasts in the same week. Next week, his episode, I believe, is about ancient Rome, and you won't want to miss it. Again, it's awesome. I can't recommend it enough. This podcast, on the other hand, which I also can't recommend enough, is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my esteemed colleague, Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk, or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback or constructive criticisms at so to speak at the fire.org or call in a question for a future show at 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, again, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. As I mentioned at the top of the show, reviews help us attract new listeners to the show. And also don't forget, of course, to subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. Until next time, fly, eagles, fly. Fly, eagles, fly.